and you're joining us here on a brand new episode of Melt. I'm Ritvika Gupta and on today's episode we'll be speaking to Richard Edelman to find out what it takes for Indian brands to go global. Anant is here with me. Anant, you spoke to Richard at length about Brand India and what's concerning is that he said there's a fundamental lack of trust in Indian brands overseas. So why do you think it's so hard for Indian brands to go global? Uh, first, the conversation was more about trust than on Brand India. Now, then within trust, I uh, went deeper into Brand India. Edelman has been measuring trust uh, in various uh, segments of society and various elements for decades now. So they measure trust in business, uh, trust in politicians, trust in NGOs, uh, and uh, the trust in the courts and so on. And uh, increasingly, trust is becoming a very, very important currency. So within that framework, to try and find out uh, how Indian brands are perceived internationally, uh, the reputation of Indian CEOs, Indian-led brands, and so on and so forth, leading to, therefore, what does it take for Indian brands to go abroad? Now we're in a situation where a lot of Indian brands have ambitions uh, outside of India. Right. We're no longer insular as we once were. So uh, a brand that uh, Richard repeatedly refers to in the conversation with us is Mahindra, for example. They're trying to sell tractors abroad, they're trying to sell scooters abroad, they're selling four-wheelers abroad, they're SUVs abroad, and so on. Uh, other brands that we've not spoken about in the conversation, say Amarico, which sells parachute coconut oil right. across the country. You've got Airtel, which is dominant in sub-Saharan Africa. So you've got lots of Indian brands which go abroad, but uh, it's a difficult mountain they have to climb because the perception of Indian-led brands or Indian headquarters brands is very poor across. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So without giving away too much from the conversation, what do you think are some of the ways in which uh, Indian brands can respond to these challenges? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the things Richard speaks about is creation of, an, of a hero brand. India needs a hero brand. Maybe, maybe Mahindra will be the hero brand. Uh, we've been famous historically for soft parts of the Indian brand. Uh, for example, you've had Ayurveda, you've had yoga, you know, stuff like that. Then you've had a non-tangible part of Indian brands, which is, uh, say, the IT power, which is basically people power. But we've not had brands that people go to counters and buy and consume and so on and so forth. So that's what we're trying to navigate over here, whether it's possible for an Indian brand to make it. And the only way, according to Richard, is you have to go out there. So before we get to the conversation, let's have a look at the Edelman Trust Barometer Report. Here are the key findings. There's a 54% gap between domestic and international trust in Indian business. In India, six big export markets, namely US, UK, South Korea, UAE, China and Brazil, only 14% of respondents could say with confidence that they had bought a product or service from an Indian company in the last 12 months. And among the same six markets, an average of 39% of people could name one Indian brand they would describe as world-class. And in US and UK, it's only 28% and 29% of people respectively. So one of the reasons for this trust deficit is uh, that overseas markets do not know what Indian brands stand for. So why do you think that's happening? Do we uh, lack a voice? No, it's not so much of a voice. I think it's, it's more uh, historical. There were... Uh, perceptions that Europe and the US were sort of the homes of high quality, high uh, finish and good products and good engineering and so on. And it took a long time for that to shift. Perhaps uh, Japan was the first country in, outside of Europe and the, and the Americas to have that stamp uh, when they started making their autos post-World War II. And uh, after that happened, it's taken a long time. China has been low quality, South Korea has been cheap. India has got clubbed into that and other elements such as low labor prices, cheap labor, uh, low ethics in business, all that we've got clubbed together with, with other Asian counterparts. So what we need to do is to break out of that and uh, Richard does give us some hints on, on how Indian brands can get out of that. Also, Anand, you know, when we have a global brand coming to India, for example, KFC, they often modify their offerings to suit the Indian taste. So do we have enough Indian brands globalizing their services and products? No, I think we haven't quite reached that stage yet where I think phase one is to get consumers to sample and trust Indian brands. And I think that's done if you look at the countries that you described. Uh, Middle East is, a, is an area which is very big. You haven't mentioned that in that uh, report. The Middle East is where Indian brands 
have a reputation of being of good quality. Mm. We need to establish ourselves in Europe, for example, as a, as a source of good quality brands. We need to do that in the U.S. So maybe uh, Mahindra will help open the U.S. market to other Indian brands when you say this is well engineered, well finished, good product, well priced and made in India. So we need a few more stories like that and uh, you need that in various verticals. We've got in the IT, ITES, where TCS, Wipro, Cognizant, Infosys, all of them are known, mm -hmm. you know, good reputed companies. We need that in the consumer products uh, area. Uh, Godrej, for example, very few people know that because they don't make a song and dance about it, is sold to 30, 40 countries across the world and they receive well across the world. So we need more heroes. We need Indian brands to be visible in shelves mm -hmm. and then we can worry about localizing like you asked in the KFC kind of example you know first get into the market then worry about localizing which is what KFC did which is what McDonald's did they came here with the international offering and once they came here they found for example that we have a vegetarian palate mm -hmm. therefore you need you know even a McDonald's has no beef in India and then they introduce say a makalu tiki and so on and so forth I think KFC clearly found that Indians uh, while they like chicken, uh, cannot consume buckets and buckets of chicken, so they localize it. So that first you enter, then you localize. But the good news is that 56% of respondents believe that Indian talent is among the best in the world. And Indian businesses is holding up well against his counterpart in China, especially when it comes to caring for the environment. What do you have to say about that? No, uh, one of the th things that, uh, again, Richard uh, covers in his talk is uh, causes, beliefs, movements, and so on and so forth. Brands have to take a stand. Uh, the, the reputation of Indian talent actually goes back many, many years. Uh, we've had the IT, ITS boom, certainly. Uh, you had Silicon Valley. You look at the number of uh, India-educated CEOs in the tech environment in the US is massive. So talent is not, uh, I think, a problem that we need to worry about. Uh, the reputation of talent is very high. Uh, the bigger uh, worry certainly is uh, whether uh, Indian brands will be able to face up to the new challenge of standing up on issues, standing up, taking a position on uh, issues, uh, brands standing for something other than the product itself. So do you stand for women? Do you stand for human rights? Do you stand for upliftment of the poor? What do you stand for beyond you know, your product or service? Absolutely. I think there is an opportunity and the report does suggest that brands need to elevate, engage and lead. So here's the conversation. Let's get ready to melt with Richard Edelman. So Richard, why is it so important to measure trust? Trust is the absolute core structure for relationship. You must have a confidence in the other party. And at the moment, with so many external shocks, the Great Recession, populism, the fears about uh, pace of innovation, automation, trust is the thing that absolutely allows society to function. Right. Now, you measure trust in government, you measure trust in business, you measure trust in uh, NGOs. Uh, so there are a lot of areas you measure trust. And this time, your trip to India is focused on the trust in business. Yeah. So. A, what is the need to have a focused study, it, in the Asia specific or global actually, uh, on business? Why is business so important today? What's happened that's remarkable is that business is now the most trusted institution in the world. Right. And it's the most trusted institution in India. Right. This is actually a revolution. Right. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden there are new expectations of corporations as a result of this. So stand up and speak up for the employees as brands stand up for your consumers. Partly because in, in many markets, um, trust in, in, in government is quite low. Um, and also people have new expectations in the belief of the power of business to make money and do good for society. Right. So when it comes to India, you look at the numbers that your study throws up. They're not terrible, but it looks like India is not, shall we say, highly thought of outside of the Middle East and uh, perhaps you know, the neighboring countries. So what do, what do Indian companies do? You've just met a few CEOs this morning. You've had some quiet meetings this afternoon. So what do Indian CEOs who have an ambition uh, do about getting dragged on, shall we say, by the national trust deficit? So for me, it's kind of stunning that uh, the image of India, the, the, the trust in India brands is, 
at the level of Russia or Mexico. Right. It's not acceptable. Absolutely. And it's a far cry from the reality. So for me, Indian CEOs have to speak up. Right. They have to talk about issues in society, as Mr. Mahindra does, for instance. Right. And they also need to have some hero products, and they need somehow to stand together for certain values, treatment of employees, sustainability, and transparency. Those are the minimum standard kinds of uh, approaches to gaining trust. In your study, you spoke about the hero products. Now, what is, in, to your mind, a hero product? Can you give us, help us uh, navigate this? What, well, the easy, the easy one is my uh, Samsung cell phone, right. <laughs> which gives great value to Korea. Right. But, you know, a Mahindra tractor can also um, somehow change the uh, equation for agriculture and allow smallholder farmers to be able to compete in the global market. That's potentially a hero product. Right. Now, it's multiple mountains to climb. One is you have to sort of get over the nation brand problem, maybe have a weak nation brand, and then you've got to rise above that to fight in a category in a new country, in a new market, if you want to export. So how, how do you overcome these challenges? Well, now, if you were to advise an Indian CEO with large emissions abroad, shall we say for in the US or in Western Europe, what would you tell him or her to do? First of all, play off your strengths. India is definitely seen as the cradle of very well-educated engineers. Right. It's seen as a place of, of, of innovation and affordable products. Um, and at the same time, you've got to deal with your negatives, right. um, which are um, being lumped in with Chinese and others about treatment of employees, which is, I think, a function of ignorance. Also, somehow that we do just have a sort of low level of awareness of of Indian brands. Only 14% of people say, I can remember a single Indian brand that I've touched in the last year. Right. That's really weak. Right, sure. So how do you think this can be addressed? One is for the government to get involved in? Uh, no. You know? no, not okay. the government. Right. No. Okay. The, right. the government's doing its job. The government has laid out the playing field. It is time for business to step up. Indian companies have to agree that this is important. If, if they are serious about being players on the global stage, they have to make Brand India, the jersey that you wear in the football match, right. mean something positive. It gives you a halo effect as the Canadian, as the German, as the Swiss. Right. You want to go into the game with confidence um, and knowing that among developing market countries, you stand apart. You don't just stand equal. You are better than um, your competitors in China and in Brazil as to how you treat your employees the values that you have about sustainability, and most of all about long-term capitalism. For me, this is a really interesting opportunity for Indian companies. It starts with Mr. Tata, who established this notion of do good and do well. Right. Um, and I think all companies in this country should take that motto. Right. It requires uh, an amount of courage and braveness to, to take, walk down those paths. You know, and you say that. Yes. But I think it's a greater risk not to, right. because you have a, a certain fear of you know too much money going to the wealthy and 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 i think again indian has india has a lot of family companies they should tell how they are improving society how well they're treating employees why people stay at these companies a long time right. and again the risk is greater By for business anything. of not communicating because you'll have a populist backlash suddenly somebody will decide we'll put tariffs on indian products right. that could happen sure um, and you don't want that. You want India to be separated out. Right, sure. So uh, is it a good idea for, say, the top 10 corporates in India to get together and say, let's attack America together? Is that easier than tackling it one by one? Look, one thing that I will say is I don't think the company should wait for a collective wisdom. Right. I think that those who want to act should stand up and go forward. Right. And others will follow because of the positive example. You know. I've seen companies today that are making investments in, in, in production facilities in Texas and other. But you want to go into that, that, that new investment, again, to attract the best employees. Oh, it's much better than working for a South Korean or a Chinese company. Right. It's, it's working for an Indian company, and they value us, and they let us be heard, and they allow us to do our jobs well. Right. Now, if somebody saw your study today and, and said, uh, I like what Richard's saying, I'm going to take his advice, what is the roadmap? How long does it? That CEO take to sort of establish 
something that is measurable. So I think Unilever is a very good example right. of a journey. So the Sustainable Living Plan, Paul Pullman, um, he did that eight, year, eight years ago. Right. And it took some time to get traction, and it took some examples uh, such as the Dove campaign for Real Beauty. Um, but you know, Unilever is now the third most desired place in the world to work after right. Google and Facebook. So it says, I joined Unilever, I want to make the revolution. Right. Um, and, and that should be the aspiration for Indian companies. They should want to attract the best and the brightest who have a chance to work in tech or other things um, to associate with, with change. And I believe also that uh, within companies, the chief communications officer needs to actually be the chief change officer, needs to push this development that needs to be the conscience in some way and also the uh, facilitator. It's not a normal, um, you know, a lot of PR people are, you know, play defense, right. but now it's time for offense. And right. uh, I think also as part of it to go direct to the end user of information. People like you who are, you know, absolutely important like hell in the media framework are important but they're not sufficient anymore right. because so many people have sworn off the media, sure. whether political or, or other reasons. And so now we have to actually improve the information context so that people are making good decisions and not just based on fear. Sure. Now it brings me to another question, which is the CEO advocacy. How important is that? You've just met a CEO, I won't name him, uh, who, is, who is a huge advocate of his own company. Now, how important is it for the CEO to be the advocate for the brand he works for. Two thirds of people in our global study of trust, the Edelman Trust Barometer, tell us, I expect CEOs to stand up and speak up and not wait for government. That's a pretty big sign. Right. They want to be absolutely convinced, if they're an employee, that you're going to stand for them. They also want to be sure that corporations do the right thing. Example. The number one thing that is expected of a CEO today, build me a trusted company. Right. It's not great products and services. It's not shareholder returns. It's build me a trusted company. Show me, don't just talk to me. Okay. What about the courage required to take a position on public issues? As we've seen with say Nike in the US, I mean, that's the most visible. How brave is that? How risky is that? And uh, should more and more companies be doing that? So look, we don't lose. there's a whole spectrum of options for brands. Right. You can do purpose, campaign for real beauty for Dove. Sure. You can do cause, Nissan or others taking uh, trucks and helping to clean up beaches. Or you can do an activism stance as Nike did um, with the NFL. The category is really important, meaning that has sporting goods, exactly. Yeah. Sporting goods is something that there is, is sort of heating up um, a constituency uh, and Nike's sales as you know have gone up sure, smartly sure. as a result of that decision but there are other examples of uh, activism one would be uh, their retailer uh, CVS in the drug store business took cigarettes out of the stores right they walked away from five percent of their revenue that was a big risk right. but, but on the other hand it was not only that but their preference went from nine percent to fifteen percent among consumers and it enabled them over time to buy Aetna <laughs> because it was a healthcare combination. Oh. So it actually changes the uh, nature of business to think not just in the day stock price, but longer term. Now tell me, th this is putting you on the spot. If Nike had called you 48 hours before they did what they did and asked you, Richard, what's your advice? Should we do it or not? What, what would your instinctive answer be? My instinctive answer would be, have you researched this? Right. Um, have you looked at uh, your core constituency and, and you know, how they'll react and, and also the adjacent uh, groups? Uh, and are you ready to be in the uh, political uh, cockpit? Right. Uh, because this is not a one-day decision. This is something that now positions the company. But really importantly, it makes Nike small, agile, and an employer of choice. Right. As opposed to being the big behemoth, they acted like the little guy who's the startup. And by the way, this is the disruptor force in business right now is all these startups. Um, and their whole ethos of, we're not going to talk at you, we're going to act for you. Right. And so final question, since we're running out of time, uh, Richard, is uh, in the absence of trust in media, should brands look at creating their own media to get their messages out, or do they still have to piggyback on a media that is less and less trusted? So for me, mainstream media is the most important aspect of communication. The core to a democracy is an informed populace and at the essence of that is media like yourself 
journalists working hard to find the truth. As a supplement, though, for less uh, covered brands or categories, it's really important that there be some means of communicating directly to end user. Now that means the PR people have to move their standard from advocacy to education, that the idea is to inform, not to persuade. And the idea then is just to supplement mainstream media and to be very clear that there is a dividing line um, between what you do and what the uh, corporation does. Right. Perfect. Uh, I know you're pressed for time, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, I wish we had time for a longer conversation, but that means you miss a flight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Thank having you. me, sir. Thank you. And that was the conversation with Richard Edelman. Anant, what can marketers learn from this conversation? I think, uh, you know, I've been a follower of the Edelman Trust Barometer Report from the time I got into writing about advertising. And uh, I think there's never been a time that the report is more relevant than than the report we saw just now. And fundamentally, it's because the dynamics have changed. For example, uh, why they're doing this deep dive into business is because there's never been a situation where business is the most trusted of the pillars. So business is so important, and I think every uh, company, every CMO, every CEO needs to look at the report and say, hey, what can I do in this changing world? All right. So I think there's a lot to learn, a lot to take away. So here's presenting the Melt Cheat Sheet. And that's a wrap on this edition of Melt. I'll see you next week, same time, same place. You can also watch all our content on our social media platforms. Next week, we'll be speaking to Siddharth Banerjee from Vodafone. I think the soul of the brand is important. And as long as that is coming out in an authentic way, in a way that's relatable to consumers, I'm happy. What is the soul of the brand? This is a brand which allows you to be at your personal best at the times that you need it. As long as we are able to consistently build that, whether it is with the Pugs or the Zuzus or Asha Bala or some of the other product campaigns that we do, including Sakhi, I think we are in the right direction. <laughs>